Oh, balance. Yeah. Okay. Finally, I'm making this one. Finally. So, this is, uh, this is going to be about demons. And origins. And scripts and the power of mentality and the power of the image. Your power. So just as much as this is going to be about what demons are, this is going to be about dispelling what what you have been led to believe demons are. Because as with everything it is dependent upon how much energy and life and emotion how much awareness you give to it how much life how much how much breath you breathe into it So, uh, this is, um, I forget, I forget her name. She's, she's very, very wonderful. Uh, all these, all these people, uh, that are at, at this round table are awesome. And then Amanda, that, that's her name here. Amanda was, was in my last one that I did. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she she she's she's cool. Uh everyone has their own uh lenses. So, yeah. But uh this is this is coming from James True's channel again and I'll leave a link to this. I highly recommend this video. And this is uh when they were at Rhinebeck. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Hopefully I'm not, I'm not talking too softly. <laughs> Probably going to go back and forth here. But, uh... Yeah, hopefully I can remember my markers. My my time stamps. My, uh, my placements. Hopefully I can uh, bring to life my angelic uh, demon uh, demonstrations. And remembrances of such. I actually was going to make this video uh, with uh, showcasing James True's video of demons and gins, because he goes uh, right into you know what it's what it's about. Well, I mean he he goes in and out of it because he he, he talks about other stuff, but. Uh, the main thing, which is uh, you, that, that you you are the the battery that that gives the electricity and the life to these images. It, it's not the opposite. No, no matter what you're led to believe with the indoctrination. And there is a caveat to that. There, there is certain circumstances where that's not the case, and and I hopefully will remember to touch upon that as well. But that that also ties into the power of human thought and willpower. So first I'm going to read a story, and uh, this story, um, it, it's up to you how real uh, you want to make it for you, uh, what what you want to believe, uh, the, the parts in it that, that you want to believe in or that you want to bring to life for yourself, and, and then realize, you know, treat it like you would uh, any kind of uh, 
parable or metaphor, uh, whatever speaks to you, listen to that. If all of it rings true for you, then, you know, listen to that. If some of it rings true, if none of it rings true, then so be it. But this is going to be a story of the creation of coinage. Uh, this is a story of slavery. This is a story of the image, the power of the image, the power of uh, tricking people into believing that they have a taste of freedom. that their circumstances have changed. And this is very timely, I think, because uh, you know, we're currently going through this. This is uh, another level of what I'm going to share here, what we're going through. But this is exactly what's happening. People are starting to wake up. And so the noose, the news is tightening its hold. And then it's going to allow certain things, uh, certain freedoms, you know, certain little allowances for people. And, oh yes, we can go back to normal. We can, we can, uh, practice the limited experience of, uh, what we thought was free will within these systems that are encapsulated and incorporated with the corpse because they are not living. They, you are, are the living thing that brings these deadened images to life. The images themselves are just templates. You, the people, bring these things to life. So as the people remember And actually remember inside the pieces of the puzzle. Then the templates that once served as A stranglehold, but but there are. This is the thing about demons: is they they show us uh, the things that are lacking inside of us, inside of the the will, uh, the mentality. Because once we see, then these demons and these templates, these uh, organizations, these corporations, they will fall. Demon Cradius. The slaves walked slowly in single file, every one of them carrying a polished stone, four lines of them, each line stretching a kilometer and a half long from the stone quarries to the site where construction on the walled city had begun, under the watchful eyes of armed guards, one military guard for every ten slaves, 
off to one side on the pinnacle of a 13 meter high mountain crafted out of polished stones sat Cradius, one of the high priests. For the past four months, he had been silently observing the construction activity. Nobody distracted him. Not a single person dared interrupt his contemplation, even with a sideways glance. Both slaves and guards accepted this artificial mountain with its throne on top as a fixed feature of the landscape. And nobody paid attention to the figure either sitting motionless on the throne or walking to and fro around the lookout platform atop the mountain. Cradius had set himself the task of restructuring the state, consolidating the power of the priests for a millennium, subjugating to them all the people of the earth, turning all without exception, including national rulers, and the slaves of the priests. One day, Cradius came down from his throne, leaving a double in his place. And the priest changed his clothes and took off his wig. He gave orders to the captain of the guard to have him bound in chains like a simple slave and placed in the line behind a strong young slave named Nard. Looking into the faces of the various slaves, Cradius had noticed that this young man in particular had a penetrating and purposeful look, not a wandering or detached gaze as did many of the others. Nard's countenance alter alternated between excitement an intense contemplation. That means he's hatching some kind of plan, the priest realized. But he wanted confirmation of the accuracy of this observation. For two days running, Cradius followed Nard's every move, silently hauling the stones, sitting beside him at mealtimes and sleeping next to him in the barracks. On the third night, Directly the sleep command had been given. Cradius turned to the young slave and in a tone of bitterness and despair whispered to no one in particular, Will this situation keep up the rest of our lives? The priest watched as the young slave gave a shudder and suddenly turned to face him. His eyes were sparkling, which was noticeable even in the dim torchlight of the cavernous barracks. It won't last much longer, the young slave whispered back. I've been working out a plan, and you, old fellow, can be a part of it. What sort of plan? the priest asked. With a sigh of indifference, Nar began to explain with an air of confidence and enthusiasm. You see, old man, soon you and I and all of us will be free men. Free men instead of slaves. Figure it out for yourself. There's just one guard for every ten of us, and one guard, two for every 15 women slaves who do the cooking and sewing. When the time comes, if we all fall upon the guards at once, we can overpower them. It makes no difference that the guards are armed and wearing chains. We outnumber them ten to one, and our chains can also be used as weapons to shield us from the blows of their swords. We'll disarm the guards Tie them up and seize their weapons. Hold on there, young man, Cradius sighed again, and added with feigned indifference, 
Your plan isn't completely thought through. Sure, you can disarm the guards watching over us, but it won't be long before the ruler sends in replacements, and a whole army, maybe, and he'll have the insurgents killed. I've thought of that too, old man. We'll have to choose a time when the army is not around, and that time is coming. We've all noticed how the army is preparing for a campaign. They're getting provisions ready for a three-month trek. That means that in three months, the army will arrive at its destination and engage the enemy in combat. It will be weakened in battle, but it will be victorious and bring back the many new slaves. They're already building new barracks to house them. We have to start disarming the guards just as soon as the ruler's army goes into battle. The couriers will need at least a month to go call it home. And it will take at least three months after that for the weakened army to return. By the time the four months are up, we'll be ready to meet them. We'll have at least as many fighters as there are in the army. The slaves they seize will once join us when they see what's happened. I've thought it all out in advance, old man. I see, young fellow. With your plan, you can disarm the guards and overpower the army, the priest answered. Already sounding more cheerful, and then added, But what will become of the slaves after that? And what will happen with the rulers, the guards, and the soldiers? I haven't given too much thought to that. Only one thing comes to mind, though. Whoever was a slave in the past will become a free man. Whoever is not a slave today will be a slave tomorrow, replied Nard, with some hesitation, as though thinking aloud. But what about the priests? Tell me, young man, after your victory, will, will they be slaves or not? The priests? Haven't thought about that either. But now I'm thinking the priests can stay where they are. The slaves and rulers listen to them. Sometimes they're hard to understand, but I get the feeling they're harmless. Let them keep on telling their stories about the gods. But we know best how to live our lives. And have a good time. Have a good time. That's great, responded their priest, and pretended he couldn't wait to get to sleep. But there was no sleep for Cradius that night. Only contemplation. Sure, he thought. The simplest course of action would be to report this to the ruler and have them seize this young slave. He's clearly the chief instigator. But that won't solve the problem. The slaves will always have the desire to be freed from bondage. New leaders will emerge. New plans will be hatched. And as long as that goes on, the main threat to the state will always be within. Cradius was faced with the challenge of working out a plan to enslave the whole world. He realized there was no way he could attain his goal through physical compulsion alone. What he needed to do was exert a psychological influence on every single individual, on whole nations of people. He had to bring about the thought of every single human every single human being to the notion that slavery is the highest bliss he had to launch a self-developing program to disorient whole nations in space time and ideas especially in their literal perception of reality Cradius's thought was working faster and faster. He was no longer conscious of his body, 
and the heavy chains on his arms and legs, and all of a sudden, like a lightning bolt, a program came to his thought. Even though all the details were still to be worked out, he could not yet explain it to anyone else. He could, al he could already feel it within, exploding off the scale. Critias was now feeling himself to be the omnipotent ruler of the world. Lying on his bunk in chains, he was full of self-exaltation. Tomorrow morning, when they're escorting us all to work, I'll give the secret signal and have the guard's captain take me out of the line and remove the chains. I'll finalize my program, say a few words, and the world will start to change. Incredible. Just a few words, and the whole world will be subject to me, to my thoughts. God really has given man a power unequaled in the universe. The power of human thought brings forth words which can change the course of history. The situations turned out very well indeed. The slaves had prepared their plan of insurrection. It's logical, this plan, and is clearly capable of leading to an interim result very favorable to them. But with just a few words, I shall ensure that not only they, but their future descendants and the rulers of the earth too, will be slaves for millennia to come. In the morning, on Critias' signal, the captain of the guard freed him from his chains. And the very next day, the five other priests, along with the pharaoh, were invited to, to his observation observation platform. Critias began his speech before the gathering as follows. What you are about to hear must not be noted down or passed along by any of you. There are no walls around us, and my words will be heard by no one but you. I have thought up a way of turning all people living on the earth into slaves of our pharaoh. That is not something one can do, even with the aid of a vast number of troops in exhausting wars, but I shall accomplish it with a few simple sentences. All I need do is utter them, and just two days later you will see how the world has begun to change. Take a look down there. And you will see long lines of slaves in chains, each slave carrying a stone. They are guarded by a host of soldiers. The more slaves there are, the better for the state. Or so we always thought. But the more slaves there are, the more we have to be afraid of their rebelling. So we increase the size of our guard. We are obliged to feed our slaves well, otherwise... They will not be able to perform their heavy manual labor, but still, they are lazy and inclined to rebellion. See how slowly they move, and how the guards have become lazy and do not bother using their whips to beat even the strongest and healthiest slaves. But they will soon be moving much more quickly. They won't need any guards. The guards themselves will be turned into slaves. This can be affected in the following way. Before sunset today, heralds will be sent out everywhere to proclaim the Pharaoh's decree. With the dawn of the new day, all slaves will be granted complete freedom. For each stone brought to the city, the free men will receive one coin. The coins may be exchanged for food, clothing, housing. Ooh, too much.
much energy there. <laughs> a place in town, or even a whole town, from here on in, you are free people. After the priests have let Cradius' words sink in, one of them, the eldest, said, You are a demon, Cradius. The demonry resulting from your plan will cover most of the nations of the world. So, I may indeed be a demon, and what I have thought up, people in the future may call democracy. At sunset, the decree was proclaimed to the slaves. They were astounded. Many of them could not sleep at night thinking about the new and happy life that lay ahead of them. The next morning, the priest and the pharaoh once again climbed up to the lookout platform atop the artificial mountain. They could not believe the scene unfolding before their eyes. Thousands of former slaves, chasing one after the other, hauling the same stones as before, dripping with sweat, Many of them were carrying two stones apiece. Others, with only one stone in their hands, were literally running, kicking up the dust as they ran. Some of the guards were also hauling stones. These people, who now considered themselves free after all, they were no longer in chains strove to obtain as many of the sought-after coins as they could, so that they could build a happy life for themselves. Cradius remained at his post on the platform for several months after that, continuing to observe with satisfaction what was going on below. The transformation was colossal. Some of the slaves had organized themselves into groups and built themselves carts. Then they piled stones on top, on top of the carts and pushed them along, their skin covered in sweat. They will invent many more devices, Critias thought to himself with satisfaction. Internal services have already started, food and water delivery. Some slaves have been eating right on the go, not wanting to waste time going back to the barracks for a meal and paying for the food delivery with the coin they've earned. Wow. They've also got doctors going around, offering help to people with physical needs right on the spot, also for coins. And they've appointed themselves traffic regulators Soon, they'll be choosing their own rulers and judges. Let them choose, after all. They consider themselves free for now. They consider themselves free now, whereas nothing has really changed. They're still hauling the same stones as before. And so they have been running down through the millennia right up to the present day. Through the dust, sweating to carry the heavy stones. And today, today the descendants of those slaves will keep up their senseless running. It just, it had to fall, didn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs>
it has to fall. My artificial structure I had the setting on as well as the artificial structure that the, uh, the system has been setting on. The design, the template, and that is the demon, the, the demon crazy, the, 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 the crazied, the, the democracy. The origin point was a void. And so something is presented to fill that void. And the disillusionment continues. That is a demon. Something that tricks you into continuing to give energy into a program. Yes, we, you know, the term, you know, uh, we have our demons. And then people will argue, well, I've, I've experienced stuff. I've seen real demons. There's, you know, the, the demons that people create, but then there's also, you know, real demons. And, oh, you don't want to see one of those. I beg to differ. The person with the fire and the willpower will burn away any kind of uh, disillusionment and demon because that word is dematerialized. The image is seen. We dissolve the words because we, we uh, go beyond the words. And back to the origin, which is the image. So in, any kind of word that has power, that, that's broken away. So then we're left with an image. We're left with an influence and the degree of willpower is going to determine the degree of influence. When, just if we, um, when we don't know what something is and we want to put it, a constellation of some experience together, we can label it as their demon, right? It's something that they're struggling with an addiction of some sort or whatnot. But in my experience and practice is that a lot of these cases where they're troubled, it comes down to either they have a parasite infection, like a legitimate one, or they have a very severe metal, um, heavy metal load that's also leading to parasites, or something where they're not in their right minds, and also they're not able to process the emotional experiences that they went through. So they're really just, uh, it's stewing in them, and it's like a cloud around them, and then it embodies them, right? Because they've kind of disassociated and externalized their emotions in a way, mm -hmm. and then they've also, in trying to actually figure out how to process them, they get labeled as things, and then they get more identification. But in the identification, then you can like manifest it into an actual thing that's like you're facing literally your demon inside of you. And you're looking at your, you're looking at your disassociated self at that point. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. It's very tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. And it's a reflection that it's trying to show you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I'm, I, I'm, I wanted to share that because that's a huge part, uh, and that's why I have so many videos talking about health, talking about um, ways to detox to get healthy. 
the gate clean inside and how that will translate to the clean how that translates into gardening the mind and having a clean soil in, in the mind so that uh, the seeds that are planted are seeds that you actually want to be planted and that will take root. Otherwise, when you have a uh, unclean mind, that also translates to an unclean body. And the seeds and the things that take root um, oftentimes are not things that you are aware of. And that's why they, are, they become loop programs. That's why they become uh, demons. It's because you have not shown your light of awareness onto them. And I don't I don't care what you want to say about the externalization of a demon. It has to do with willpower and your ability to be in control of your systems. So, but we externalize it because it's really challenging, obviously, to have objectivity. <laughs> it's you, that's the whole thing. That's why we need reflectors, right? Exactly, and, and that's the beauty of uh, finally being able to find people that uh, are of like mind and like heart, or for for the person suffering to finally be able to find someone that can empower them by giving them ways and suggestions into taking back control of their uh, body and mind. Mind, first and foremost, because everything's of the mind. And that would translate into an understanding of the body. As within, so without. As above, so below. Physical beings, have, or spiritual beings, having a physical experience. So uh, we have the free will here. <clears throat> and when, like somebody's with their, like Amanda mentioned, with, with addictions, and um, that kind of fits in with, with my philosophy on uh, possession, where, where the, the deeds, the demons, um, uh, there's, an, there's, a, there's a segment of those entities that uh, use influence to gain position. So if somebody's weakened by a, uh, an addiction or uh, some manner of disease, then uh, their will is also weakened. And well, sometimes you'll just have somebody who's pestered incessantly from this energy, and eventually they relent. But it's not. It's not that entity intruding, taking over this person against their free will. It's this person giving it up. And that is the power that we all possess, is the right for sovereignty over our own physical being in a spiritual element. So I love this guy. He, he's, not, he's not discounting that there are uh, phenomena that can be observed and experienced. But what he is saying is that it has to be allowed in first. And there are many ways in which uh, the allowance happens. Oftentimes people don't realize that they are, um, you know, uh, you hear the word contracts. And, and also, all of this ties into uh, New Age uh, thought and mentality. And even the people that I 
um, fucks with on the tubes. Um, still, who? There's a lot of new agey shit, a lot of new agey mentality, and I understand. I understand, and even that word uh, that people are still using, and, and I recognize that they recognize that they're still using these words because they don't know, they, they don't have um, a better terminology yet. But they they realize that it's not just the projection of that wordage. But then there's also, uh, you know, deeper level things, and I won't get into that right now. All, all I will say is that always try to tie it back into how does this incorporate with the power of choice, the power of free will. And, and, and fuck any kind of uh, ideology about, you know, do we have free will or not? Just Just realize, do you have choice? And if you don't think you have choice, well, then you're in um, a whole little world of your de uh, demonology, your, your demonry. You've subjugated your mind into a, a democratic state. Yes, you know, that there are higher levels of things, and yes, things play out um, on different dimensions, on, on different wavelengths, and in different times, and in different motions, in correlation with these times, with these uh, reverberations. But that, but that doesn't mean that it was all set up. That doesn't mean that it was all already written. That doesn't mean that we already laid it out for ourselves this way. That also isn't to say that that's not the case. That also isn't to say that that isn't possible. But think about it as two sides of of, of a coin and. and it, it collapses, like, like I keep saying, the sweet spot that is you, that is your ability to choose and create in the moment. To create a new moment in every moment, a new image, a new vibration, a new feeling. You have that choice. No matter what uh, belief system you want to hold on to, realize the felt experience, and you have a choice of what you want to feel. Like a routine thing, right? And it's torture. But it's like they can't, their nervous system even can't close it. Like I'm very anatomy, physical, physical. Hmm. Let's see if I can remember. Dreams and scary things. Make sense for them. And I have a lot of people that they believe it's a demon, and, they, and I go with whatever they believe. One of my teachers. from the forest or whatever but that's what I'm saying like at what point do some of these thought forms break off and, and become I remember one of my one of my teachers that's what they believed that's like some of the Hindu beliefs were like you know that's what happens we're making we're we're making the mess we're making these we're, right. crea we're creators and we're right, creating exactly things. so basically it's all coming back to every form of demon that we can fathom has all come from some form of traumatic attachment that it basically has fed the fear into this certain like attachment and 
depending on how strong the concept is, it either carried and was broadly accepted or it's just plagued certain belief systems, say, in families. Like, I'm more prone to get sick from this or I'm more prone to be an alcoholic or abusive because my family was. And it's, um, then you're fighting your demons and it just kind of seems like even the ones where you can say that it might be a real spiritual battle that's been going on for however long, like how long has that consciousness been around and where did it start? Did it start as an attachment that was like in this now? Yeah. That's fucking beautiful. Uh... This person, I don't know her name either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she's very very in touch and tune. All these people are fucking awesome, like I keep saying. But uh, that's the idea of, uh, what is it, uh, you know, curses, uh, family curses, or, uh, you know, the evil eye, even. And then, you know, what she says, the origin point, where does this originate from? You know, is, is this a... A tangible thing where this or originated from or is this just a story that keeps being passed on generation to gener generation and it, it has enough um, energy uh, to where the belief is strong enough that it keeps continuing on is that not what we are going through currently a generation of uh, belief, a, a curse. Where did this originate from? Where did this curse originate from? And why has the belief continued? For so long, what have been the steps, the process into encouraging this? I won't, I won't go fully into it, but I will say that it is the entire system that has been set up. The indoctrination system is set up so that you continue to perpetuate this belief to be reliant on this system, on this curse, on this demon, and giving your power away to it. Giving a piece of yourself to it and Being vacant, and this is what uh, James True goes into, is the vacancy. Being evacuated. That That's really the only way any kind of uh, demon or negative or whatever kind of terminology you want to use, that kind of energy uh, can have an influence on you, is if you become vacant in some way, evacuated. Your willpower, through through whatever means it may be, leaves for a time, and then and then something is allowed to come in. Well, let's not forget that just like there's epigenetic trauma, there's epigenetic wisdom too. So. <laughs> ancient wisdom um, many of us who are uh, waking waking up now um, are tapping into this and going through a lot of similar things happening with uh, you know you can call it synchronicities you can call it telepathy uh, a lot of similar interesting things in the dream time and the astrals
Mm. You know, that was profound for me with that little simple scene. And everyone else that I know that I've um, introduced that to, it's amazing. Oh, let's see. What did he say? What happens to them if they eat peanuts? You find them. Okay. You're, you're already picking up stuff. You're picking up stuff. One of the things that we would say is four hideous horsemen came out of the big book, the great book. Don't beat it up. That's all it is. It's the book. It is uh, terror, frustration, bewilderment, and despair. Despair is that hopelessness. When you get to that point, like I said, the gift of desperation is to finally reach out to something that you never would have before. And these, these doorways open up. I don't know whether it's angels, I don't know what it is, but there's something there. And it's almost a guarantee every time. So I just wanted to add that to the that beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah, that guy uh, talks a little about a little bit about alcoholism and um, essentially like the recovery and how it's presented uh, not not just with you know that alcohol is the problem but that there is a, a deeper rooted uh, deep seated uh, problem and so this is a healing the body and the mind So it's it's recognizing why things are happening. The the, the root causalities, causations. Mm. Also something I, I think maybe James True said it in this one. He may have said it in the other one. Uh, the the demons and jinn, but basically like these things exist on a layer of memory, and that's what he says. Uh, it, it's it's more like a layer of potentiation, and then we bring that to life with our energy and emotion, and if we want to tie a certain emotion. Uh, to the imagery of you know it being good, it being angelic, or it being negative, or uh, of a, a lower vibration demon. You know, there there's that image of uh, you know a demon on one shoulder and then and then the angel on the other, uh, both speaking in your ear. And that's not untrue. The thing is, is that they're both you. There's no, there was never supposed to be a separation in the first place. That, that, that's the main thing here. Is the uh, the origin of separation. I just turn it into something else or I turn it into something practical. So, for example, I had a, a, a girl who be, actually be befriended, and she was very uh, sensitive, like Aaron, could see everything, look very clear, and even communicate with them. And she was constantly telling me, oh my gosh, this demon did this, this, da, 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 da. And every time she saw me, it was a drama with all of these different experiences. And after a period of time, because I knew her over a whole period of the summer, and then she came back another winter, is that she's addicted to it. She was addicted to her child mind that wasn't hadn't matured into her adult self, looked to that for drama in her life that made her either different, important. So for her, it was a pathology. But it didn't matter, and it wasn't to judge her. It was just I was trying to help her through that. So navigate the origin. Navigate mm -hmm. back towards the root causalities. Because most people have these addictions. They have these uh, demons, if you want to say, say it like that. But how we stop these loop programs, how we stop these repeated patternings, 
these repeated happenings that happen throughout our life because we interject with awareness, with willpower, with gnosis. We experience it in the raw, as in we finally have that experience where we just experience it. And then we're like, oh, fuck. That's what's been going on. So uh, this, this is what's happening on a mass scale right now. Is we have people going through this where, oh, fuck, really? That's what's been going on this whole time? And then uh, the other side is people putting on the masks and saying, oh, my God, no, we need vaccines. We need more, uh, you know, social distancing. We need more rights taken away. And even just saying that, our rights are being taken away. Like, realize the setup to begin with. Like I said in the story before, the design was that you thought you were free. Okay? So that she could see she was wanting them, she was calling them to process her inner child work. And so I just shipped, I did, well, we did Reiki exchanges with her, it was really great. But she, she put it together that she could shift the perceptions and how she was translating herself into inner child work. And then the next few times I saw her, it was just, we didn't even talk about it anymore. It wasn't her. Her first, like she just would almost she wanted to be in her addictions cult. She wanted yeah. me to talk about my stuff. Yeah. She wanted to feed yeah. on it. So, so that are you saying that there is an outside entity in this case? I don't, I don't think anything is outside. I think everything's inside. Blam. Yeah. So yes, um, this this uh, virus, this uh, the Karen virus, you know, it's it's wanting to suck you into it. Uh, don't don't get sucked into this shit, people. Don't get sucked into this shit. And yeah, maybe it's uh, you know entertaining or you know fun in the moment, but realize the virus that you're entertaining, and realize that you're allowing an an in for something to take root. And, and yeah, if you can realize that, and, and still, you know, play the jester, um, in order to, uh, help people realize the, the ridiculousness of it, then, fuck yeah. But, if you're just, uh, you know, making fun of shit, then that's, it's already sunken in to you. So yeah, I have a card that I drew here, so I will share that now. Super synced up with a lot of us, I know. Temperance. An angel. Or is it a demon? 
stands on the bank of a river with one foot on land and one on, in the water. The feathers of his vast wings shimmer like iridescent leaves, like some celestial alchemist. He pours a magical liquid between two chalices. Rays of light stream from his head to the sun. With grace and precision, Temperus blends the different elements of his life into a work of art. The resulting harmony shines from deep in his being. He teaches us to balance opposites and urges a moderation in all things. By integrating our inner and outer realities, the beauty of our own unique selves can emerge. Everything done by the angel is well thought out and deliberate. And I would just say everything done in an angelic mind state, in a holistic mind state. He cautions you to think before you act, examining the situation carefully before making a commitment or a decision. The best course of action may be to take no action, at least for now. Temperance often brings the message of a need for physical or spiritual healing, creative self-expression through art, maybe just the right medicine. And, and that's something I've been going through recently, so that's, that's fucking perfect. Uh, Get the devil off your back so you can fucking dance. Uh, re realize that the difference between a demon and an angel is you, it is your choice, your mentality. Release back into your free flow and into the direct experience. Because that's going to teach you everything in that engagement with an experience. That's when you truly learn and open up. So flow with it. Flow with the process. And remember that sometimes we need to be in stillness and silence. And then also sometimes we just need to explode and have that release so that we can recalibrate where that homeostasis, where that sweet spot is. Surf, it's, it's surfing the waves, the sine waves. Not getting caught up in the ups or the downs, but realizing where the sweet spot is and that sometimes we need to have checks and balances so that we can recalibrate, reintegrate, and remember ourselves and the roots and the origins. Peace.